Welcome to Happy Path Programming. I'm Bruce Eckel. I'm James Ward. So, in this episode, we're introducing our third co-author, Bill Frazier. For our book called Prep. Well, no, I'm just kidding. It's, no, <laughs> Bill's, no, like, no. Bill's, Bill's going. No, that's, no, that's not it's the probably re- the current working title is um, effect oriented programming, which, yeah, right. I mean, I'm kind of. We should run that by Kit, but we'll get there. We, we will. Yeah. We will run really? it by Kit. So, so Bill first, Frazier, he's here actually here with us in the flesh because he lives here in Crested Butte with us and has yeah. been a long time friend and um, Scala developer with us. and. Yeah, so we get to learn lots of fun stuff together. Bill, I think, told me he learned Scala from the book that Diane and I wrote, but now he's way, way ahead of me (laughs) and is telling me how things work, which I'm fine with. (laughs) Yeah, uh, Atomic Scala was my entry point to the Scala language. Uh, This is Bill Fraser talking now. Um, Yeah, so it was a great jumping off point. Um, But now as time has progressed and you get deeper and deeper into the FP side of Scala and we've got exciting projects like CATS and more particularly this episode, Zio. um, Yeah, that's where my interests lie now. And that's what Kit and I bonded over when we briefly worked together. (laughs) We uh, had a shared interest in both Zio and Laminar, and he's gone on to make a lot of cool things with that, which I'm sure we will discuss at some point during this episode. And before Scala, your background was in C++ and Java mostly? Yeah, primarily Mm -hmm. Java. Um, and I finally made the exit from that world last year and hopefully can stay in the Scala space for at least a few years <laughs> yeah. until something way better comes along. <laughs> yeah. Until Unison takes over. Right. Unison. Yep. Yeah. That's yes. Okay. Well, give it, tell us about Kit. Where um, am I? Where am I, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Kit Langton, he is currently working at Zverge, where he's just contributing to all sorts of, you know, the core project. Uh, for Zio. For Zio. Yeah, if we haven't mentioned it before, Zverge is where all things Zio come from. That's right. And is it Zverge or Zverge? I is- like your I like your alternate pronunciations, but I think it's I think it's like diverge. So I'm uh, guessing diverge. Oh, but you know, maybe right. Zverge you do that, like Z- Zella Z. Or whatever. <laughs> Zelda, that Zelda was the idea. Of course, you never know how it's going to come out. <laughs> diverge. Okay, so diverge. I like diverge. Awesome. Yeah. So Kit was doing some really cool macro layer construction work for Zio um, before they finally brought him into the fold full time, and. He's had a lot of public facing work since then. So that's how I've kind of kept up to speed with what he's doing. But yeah, I'll hand it over to him. He does to, awesome uh, live coding sessions. Yes. Symposiums. Very <laughs> symposiums, fun stuff. Twitches. Are the symposiums on the Twitch? Is that the. Uh, sort of. No, we've, we've been pub- publishing those to YouTube every. We do it every That's Friday right. on, on Zoom. Yeah. That's what I have to do after this. Oh, nice. um, and then we post it to YouTube. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's good the, to have you, Kit. We are... Um, great to be here. We are thrilled to 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 have somebody that's created such awesome stuff on the, on the show. So, um, Okay. You. How did you get into Zio? Yeah. So, okay. I, I'll give the medium version. We'll see if it overflows or something. Feel free to stop me. Cut me off kick me off at any point. Um, but I originally got into, there's a little bit of background. I got into Scala by way of Haskell. Uh, okay. You come from the Haskell world. Sort of. It just is an amateur for a bunch of years. I was trying to enter it professionally to no avail. Uh, I didn't have the PhDs required by most of the jobs that existed at the time. Uh-huh. There seem to be slightly more now. Yeah. But I no longer care about Haskell. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I do. I still care about it. But Scala has usurped uh, huh. my passion there. Yeah. It, it knocked it off the, the throne. 
Uh, but yeah, so I was I was into Haskell a lot, and I was looking for a Haskell job, and then by way of rounding error, I got myself a Scala job. I was looking for a Haskell job, did not find one, found Scala. They said, this is basically the same thing. You'll enjoy it. And I, I did not at all at the beginning. I really hated it. Uh, it was really <laughs> confusing. Uh, I definitely came in with a bunch of hubris because it's like, oh yeah, I know the functor hierarchy. I know the category theory terms. I got this. This is fine. But then you I got tossed Monet, into like Monet. futures and play framework or Aka or something that was very not that world. Yeah. And like all these, like the, the, the by whatever, the two paradigm language, multi-paradigm language, which is like, you could code in every way. The first code base I was exposed to just had every, every developer had its, had their own code style. And, uh, it was really hard to learn stuff with implicits. Took a lot of time to get used to. This was before IntelliJ like sort of helped you out with imports. <laughs> yeah. so I would copy paste code and like this method doesn't exist. Am I crazy? It was, this language is gaslighting me. This existed in that other file. <laughs> what, where does this come from? And it's like in some nested trait cake pattern. So you kind of work your way up the whole code base to figure out how to get a method to execute to exist. Um, so it was very, <laughs> a lot of rage against uh, Scala. Um, and then, you know, I used libraries like cats, which, you know, just wasn't as nice as I was used to Haskell's type inference. And it was just easy. It just worked, right? It was made for that. Um, and cats just did not give me the ergonomics that I was used to. And with the implicits and the, the subtyping, it was just so many new concepts and my, my head was spinning. Uh, I thought so it was, you went I thought and it registered good. Scala LOL dot, or yeah, Scala so dot I, LOL after this experience. Of rage, I registered <laughs> Scala dot LOL. <laughs> uh, no, that was much, much later, but I should have at the time. That was certainly my feeling. Um, but what happened next? I, uh, so yeah, I worked at that job and I was kind of begrudgingly a Scala developer for a, about a year uh, until I, I sort of heard about Zio and I saw like some, you know, some posts saying like one monad to rule, rule them all. It sounded, I was skeptical. I was like, no, I, that sounds too, too, too convenient, too markety even maybe that's sort of a pejorative <laughs> use sometimes against them now away. Um, but I finally tried it out and, and it immediately was incredibly impressive. Um, and it kind of solved all the problems that it, that it had, um, and sort of just rewired my brain. Uh, it was a very well-written library. It reminded me of one of my favorite ways of writing Haskell. There's a library called Polysemi, which huh. is an extensible effects library for Haskell written by Sandy McGuire, a very smart fellow who wrote a bunch of good books. Huh. Um, and Do you know if this John extensible... was inspired by that Haskell library? I don't think so. I think, I think it's mostly a coincidence. Um, th but both of them very much, uh, allow you to express sort of the onion architecture in a very nice mm. way where you sort of write your application in these, well, in Zio terms, it's these layers, uh, la as in layers of the onion. Um, it's a totally different encoding in polysemi in these extensible effect systems. It is, uh, you, you basically write mini ASTs, mini DSLs, uh, which are just these things called gadgets, generalized algebraic data types. They're basically just abstract syntax trees for an API, essentially. You could think of it as a trait in data form. And then you sort of, you write your app in terms of these and you'll have a very high level one. And then you can reinterpret them into lower level gadgets. So it's this mini transpo like nano transpilation cycles, um, which eventually, after you're done transpiling it, should turn into the actual language itself. So the IO, the IO monad in Haskell or just, you know, effectful Scala code in, in Scala. But it lets you write your app at a very high level and it sort of composes in a very nice way where you don't have to intermingle everything. I'm very prone to code anxiety. So I, if I cannot very nicely factor my app, I get stressed out. So <laughs> these tools uh, reduced my anxiety. And yeah, I fell in love with Zio. And then I looked at the code base and realized that, you know, if you embrace things like variance in Scala, it becomes way better at type inference. And I, yeah, I kind of really enjoyed it. And I just love dot notation. I like autocomplete. I'm lazy. Haskell does not have that. You have to prefix, uh, it is prefix notation with all your functions. They're just all free functions. There are no modules. So it, yeah, it was kind of the best of both worlds. And I'm, I'm, I've now fully love Zio and Scala and, and that's my, that's my story. So it sounds like your background in Haskell made it a lot easier for you to grasp Zio. Possibly. Yeah. I cannot, I only have the weird path that I took and I'm not even like, I have a weird path for Haskell too. Cause I actually started in Ruby on rails and then went to Haskell kind of wow. tangentially. So I didn't have like the whole academic background for that. It was definitely a struggle to get IO in my head in the Haskell world. Um, so I can imagine it's a struggle for people who are just jumping straight to functional effects in Scala, probably a similar struggle. Um, 
but yeah, that definitely helps. The IO part wasn't, I kind of got that concept. Um, though, interestingly enough with Haskell, it's, it's, it's part of the core language. So I actually got away with not really knowing how it was implemented, hmm. but with, with Zio, it's implemented atop the language. It's a construct of it's, it has its own runtime. You don't really have to hack the, the GHC runtime, the Haskell runtime very often. Hmm. Uh, so it was very educational. And I think I actually understand it better since coming, uh, over and, and, you know, implementing it myself a few times in, in demos. Plus you, you worked with, you said you worked with cats for a while, so you got to see their perspective on it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I ever worked with cats effect. That was a little earlier at the time. Monix. I think we used Monix at my first company, yeah. which is similar, same, all the same concept basically. So I'm trying to kind of start working on the first two chapters of this book where we, we set the hook and we explain all these things and I, it's a lot. Yeah. And so I want to get your perspective on mm -hmm. like from beginner's mind, what all this stuff is about. And I noticed like when one of John Degoe's recent uh, presentations, which was all very introductory, mm -hmm. except he just started casually throwing. I mean, he was carefully explaining how concurrency worked. But then mm -hmm. he would casually throw in the term effect as if you already knew what that was. And yeah. so what I <laughs> am hoping to do is like make it super clear from the beginning. Here's why effects. Yes. Why well, effects. Here's here's functional. Here's pure functional programming. Can't do anything with that unless you somehow have a connection to the outside world. And that's where effects come in. But. Mm -hmm. How would you describe what effects are to, you know, someone who's never heard of them before? I mean, I'm glad you're taking a stab at it because it is hard. And I think that, you know, the curse of knowledge is, is real. And, and John is very cursed by knowledge. I mean, he's, he's I, very impressed with his teaching abilities mm -hmm. uh, extremely. But like, it's all, we all have blind spots and it's easy to, it's really hard to, you have to, in your head, have a mental model of someone who doesn't know as much and you've got to make sure that's consistent and it's easy to sort of <laughs> accidentally ingest a huge chunk of prior knowledge. Um, and effects are a huge concept and they involve a lot of machinery. Um, I, I, I think what Zio tries to do is, is definitely before even explaining it, I think there are multiple tactics, but one, one is just impress people with the raw power, the potential of using them to the point that they are then activated enough to, do the investment in, in learning. So that that's instead of just, I think that's kind of the curse of there's this, there's this in Haskell, this bit of a mockery of the meme of the Monad tutorial and Oh God, everyone writes a Monad tutorial and they're all failures. Actually, you know, I actually kind of don't like that meme. I think people should, I think it's good when people try to explain things and, and you know, yeah, they don't all work, but um, it's, like it's a tough with concept. With monads, I've, I've said that you should use monads for five years before you try to actually understand what they are. <laughs> Yeah. 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 That's, that's totally fine. I, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it gets to the problem of there's this difference between abstraction and concretion and people when explaining, I think these, these functional programming concepts, they've already understood how they work. And then they sort of are now interested in teaching the mechanics of it instead of the actual practical benefits of it. And you kind of need you kind of need both. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Certain people are driven just to the mechanics of it. I think what I first wanted to learn about Haskell because I was like, what the hell is a monad? What's a functor? That's those words are just sitting there and pissing me off. And I want to know what they are. But that like not every some people are like, those words suck and I hate you and I hate that language and, and I don't need them because I'm productive. So there, there people have different approaches to that. And I, I, I'd like to bring in other people who aren't similarly sort of broken as I am, who just want to like waste all my time and have too much free time on their hands to learn about an obscure piece of terminology that has no practical benefits to them. Um, so to actually answer your question mm -hmm. about like, what is, how would I go about explaining uh, that? I mean, the very simple idea is that it's, it's a recipe instead of actually something that occurs. Uh, the Runar Bjarnson has a really great talk about, I forget his, whatever it's, it's the liberties constrain and constraints liberate talk. I forget sure. which one that is. I'm not sure if he's, everyone's paraphrasing other people who said it better, uh, <laughs> but uh, he, he sort of refers to them as um, the difference between having dynamite, sort of this 
concrete reified form of explosion versus actually dealing with explosions themselves. Like you cannot move explosions that are currently exploding around your whatever your abandoned castle or whatever you're blowing up. But dynamite is this sort of reification of an explosion that you can manipulate and compose and combine together and get, let's get double the explosion by strapping two sticks of dynamite to this, uh, whatever caravan of hostages or whatever you want to do with uh, your your dynamite. Um, and and, and otherwise you just, just be exploded in in a pit of fire. And I think (laughs) <laughs> that has a sort of a tangible, uh, it's a tangible metaphor because yes, you don't want to <laughs> be on fire and exploding all the time, which is sort of how I felt when working with these, when, with non-effect systems in, in large code bases, it very quickly feels like everything's blowing up and I'm kind of in, in some Indiana Jones temple of doom scenario running through my code base is like a giant boulder is approaching me. <laughs> so anyway, future is an explosion because it'll start executing it's, yeah, it blows up right away it. and then you got to start running and chasing it and it's like a little yeah a little relay race um but it's it's i think there's this curse the paradox of teaching functional programming which is functional programming is uh, to a large degree about abstraction and abstraction in order to pay for itself you sort of need a com- it's all about sort of dealing with complexity so in simple examples those which are good for teaching you, as a teacher, I'm sure you've written a lot of books. You not, you want little nice constrained examples that prove exactly what you want. And those are great for proving the mechanics. You could sort of show it, but then you lose the why, the benefit of functional programming, because it's not this hard-coded little cool convenience thing. OO sort of wins out in the smallest constrained examples because it's, it's just doing the thing. It's not preparing for anything else. Compositionality is the benefit of functional programming. But and that means breaking large problems into small problems. And it starts to pay for itself when you and your problems get bigger. It's kind of pointless. It's like, why are you doing this? This is a mental masturbation exercise if you just use all this abstraction for a small problem. That's actually an anti-pattern. I would recommend you would never. I mean, we talked about this on another episode that you would never have a single monad. Like, like, there's, like the whole reason for monads is to make them work together with other monads. Like, like a single monad is kind of useless. <laughs> Yeah, you'd be a kind of a crazy person. Like, why did you just purposely obfuscate a list for no reason or optional for no reason? Um, Concretion is just as powerful as abstraction is something that I think that people with an FP bent sort of need to to learn. You can sort of get tantalized by the power of abstraction, but then you need to remember the power of just something that is described exactly what it is and it's fit for a particular purpose. And uh, that's very potent. Um, I don't know how that helps to teach it. It's a complicated thing. Because yeah, it it. Uh, I guess what you're highlighting is that a lot of the benefits, a lot of the why, is stuff that you don't really understand until you're at some level of complexity. Like you need to refactor, you need to compose, you need to you know do do something that is down that complexity spectrum. And so the the simple the simple examples don't convey the why. You know what's interesting about this is that there were there were things that we worked with in earlier languages. Um, well, like take exceptions, for example. They're very clear in the small, but then when you start getting, lar- or, or threading, both of them, you know, you go, oh, I can understand this in the small, but then when the scale starts to increase, they begin to break down. And what we're talking about here is something that isn't necessarily that clear in the small, you know, why do I have all these tiny little functions? But when you start composing them, when you, when you, when things start getting big, it becomes clear why it's valuable. Yes. To, to use the, the, the FP term, they're sort of duels of each other. Um, yeah, they're, they're, which is just the fancy, they're, they're inverses of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it makes teaching a paradox because OO is kind of easier to teach. Uh, I, I, I do think. Well, it wasn't at first. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So you you wrote a bunch of books, um, which I, I'm actually, I've sort of just committed only via Twitter to trying to write some kind of book-like thing. So I definitely want to ask you about <laughs> nice. uh, uh, that that process. But yeah, how how was it in the beginning? Um, I'm, I'm guessing you taught OO when it wasn't this universal go-to. It wasn't. Um, um, I, I started with... Uh, a very early version of C++, which produced C code. Mm -hmm. And when I got to virtual functions, I had to generate the C code and look at it and go, what is it doing and why is it doing this? 
And so I was coming up from the mechanics of the thing. Oh, it's, it's, you know, it's doing this, this weird function in direction thing. Why do we even want to do that? And then slowly, you know, I, I didn't have the background to understand the design aspect of it. So I explained it in terms of shapes and stuff like that. Well, and thinking in Java for me was the book that, that taught me, Oh, Oh, that was, that was the, that was my movement from Perl style code to, to actual, Oh, oh. so it was, I think it was a breakthrough book for me. And, and we want to do concepts. that in this book. We want to do that. The chapter that kind of explains everything so that you know what you're going into. And mm -hmm. so use it first and then we'll explain it. Isn't really going to go good. Isn't going to work for this book. Yeah. People yeah. have to it's know why they're doing it. Yeah. Well, it's great to start with the motivation and I'm, I'm, I think dealing with that, the problem of, you know, it's hard to say like, trust me, trust me on this a little bit, but I, I think people will, you're going to need it. You <laughs> Sorry. You're going to need it. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're going to need it. Yeah. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that done in too many books and it's just, I find it very unsatisfying, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, it's a hard problem. I'm not sure if I have an answer for it. No. Uh, and it's, and that's interesting though, that it's sort of, yeah, because OO, I think having sort of started, I guess I only officially started my first programming job in 2016. So I, there's so, you know, I, I regularly read blog posts and white papers from like <laughs> before I was born and, and, uh, and certainly most of them are before I was doing code. And yeah, I'm just curious what, what, now that sort of OO has entered the, the global consciousness and is this touch point that you can use as a, as a metaphorical, you know, uh, you can assume that the audience of most programming books is familiar with it because they've been taught it. Um, but the fact that that's maybe not necessarily innately, you know, we'd have to raise a child in captivity uh, and teach teach them, <laughs> two children, obviously, <laughs> right. one FP, one, one OO, and see, <laughs> see which one is just easier to learn innately. They'd just be um, fighting all the time. <laughs> yeah. Bill, yeah. it's too bad you're not having Bill, twins. you could cause... do that with... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could we... do that experiment with your kids. Oh, yeah, the tabs child, the spaces child. <laughs> <laughs> Just a blank slate for any crazy experiment we want to run. That's right. uh, yeah, but as far as I think some of the, the FP benefits that you see as the scale starts to grow, I think... You know, Zio has these three type parameters, which we haven't actually spelled out. It's got the environment, it's got the air channel, and it's got the result. Mm -hmm. And I think those first two are what really shine as your program gets more complex. You know, as you mm -hmm. can compose these together and you say, all right, this one needs this you know, database in its environment, and we need this Kafka system over here. And as you compose them, your environment now says, I need both of these things. And similarly for the error channel, and especially with Scala 3 and Zio 2, we've got some really cool capabilities there for just mm -hmm. anding those types together. And I just love to hear some input from you about that kit and you know what this yeah, next sure. version of Zio is going to do for us. Zio oh, two sure. and Scala three and <laughs> that's what yeah, our book no, is going to use is Scala three and Zio two. So. Oh, awesome! Okay, very cool. Yeah, no, uh, I've definitely we're, I'm definitely focused on making Zio as as I mean, it's already it was already deeply impressive, but sort of just doubling down on on its ergonomics and sort of auditing the API and making sure everything makes sense and really being a, a total pedant and making sure that all the methods that like have the same nouns and verbs in them are, are tangentially related. Like go, going down to that level, I have a whole spreadsheet of like, these methods both end in the word to, uh, as in like into or something, but they kind of have different semantics. Can we like separate these things out? I think that's a, that's an important thing to do. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's sort of, because that, that was my experience with Zio is basically that, except with, with some rough edges um, uh, over time uh, as different people contribute. But like, you know, I would, I had the experience of just like reaching for something, hoping it was there, typing in, by typing in a method and seeing it autocomplete before me being like, that's very, that's a great experience. That's basically the ideal user experience. You reach and they've pre-anticipated 
your your need and and it's just it's just it's just there well and knowing um, what name to begin looking for because it's it's logical or consistent consistent yeah mm-hmm. so that's a big focus which isn't like a technical feature obviously there are technical features like a new runtime uh the new sort of tokyo based scheduler uh the the the, the macro thing that i that i wrote zeo magic is going to be insourced and and removing the name magic uh, it's just you know, it's, it's gonna, no longer magic. It's just, it's, just yeah, it's, it's mundane at this point. It's just there. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other stuff, but yeah, obviously Scala three. Okay, so Zio two actually isn't yet the version that sort of is is going to rethink itself for Scala three purely. So I don't actually think by default we might add a custom operator for this, but the sort of the, being able to unify errors into disjoint union types, so getting them to or oring them together. Right, if you have two different effects. And you uh, zip them together or flat map them together in some way, compose them. And one fails with domain error A and the other fails with domain error B. Currently in ZO1 and also in ZO2, uh, it uses um, variants and it will, it will sort of find the, the, lo- the least upper bound of these and sort of unify them into their super type. So if they both happen to be part of the same sealed trait, they'll get upgraded to that sealed trait, which is lovely. Uh, um, didn't we see in Scala 3 now, it'll actually give you the product type uh, of your two errors, which is amazing and magical. We were like, what? That didn't just happen. Um, oh, wait, it, it already works with Scala? It already works. Yeah. 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 We were oh, mind shit. blown. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Never mind. But, it's, but, it, is a, but it is a product it, or it's, it's the and, right? It's the. No, it's, it's not the, the pipe. union. It was the union. It's it's the or. It was uh, the or. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the it's the pipe this right? or yeah. this yeah. Or. pipe operator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's so confusing. It's because that's technically called a union type, which sounds like and, but it's the disjoint union. That's right. for disjoint yeah. union. So it's really or. Uh, basically, all of most functional programming concepts turn into and or or, uh, and I really wish we could just okay product coproduct product sum. Some and crow product are the same. They both mean or. Uh, <laughs> product means and. Uh, yeah, disjoint union, that's or. Uh, <laughs> it's so many words. Yes. Intersection and. So our experience was that as you compose these together, it will cobble together these union error types. But at that's least amazing. when we tried it, if we then plugged in, if we handled one of those errors, it wouldn't correctly remove it from mm-hmm. the union is that the long-term goal so that you can be adding and subtracting errors from oh that would be supremely ideal uh, if if you do catch some and then you only catch one of those errors to sort of do the set r- difference um yeah. <laughs> from the from the error type that would be ideal the question is will scala's type system handle that automatically do we have to sort of <laughs> rejigger the code like scala is a beautiful language and very powerful but it's also kind of broken especially scala 2 hopefully scala 3 is less so and they can improve these things in a more lawful way i think that's the whole point of it we've seen Um, some evidence to that effect we've been quite impressed by some of the things that it's told us we're like oh uh, that makes sense i mean yeah i've heard good things i mean that the whole point of it is that they rewrote it to have a a fundamental foundation that is that mathematically calculus, yeah exactly a calculus yeah in the, in the real word in the real definition sometimes fp people just like to use the word <laughs> calculus to mean like trait um but no they actually proved things and did things that i don't understand so i have uh, a question mm-hmm. we've encountered all right so what's happening with zio is that it goes through some sort of it it like somehow compiles its own code to an intermediate form, which then gets executed later. Like interpreter pattern. Yeah, it's sort of like there's an interpreter that gets run on this code at some later point than when you see it in line in your Scala code. Yeah, well, you can sort of think about it. Yeah, it is. It, I mean, so much in, of computer stuff is like if you squint, it's kind of a, a compiler. Mm-hmm. Um, and And this is just a little more... I guess concretely that uh, when you use, you know, the constructors, when we call it like the recipe or the, the intuition of it being a recipe, functional effects being a recipe, really is it's like a it's data, right? So it's it's some sealed trait hierarchy. It's an ADT, an algebraic data type. So a bunch of ands or ors of different data uh, in some kind of uh, you know big tree, and and it I think it sounds almost too fancy though or too complicated to like say it's being transpiled or or compiled even like you get you give it this data type and then when you finally at the end of the world 
you write run, there's a big run loop, an imperative run loop that takes your, your data type and sort of it has its own stack and it sort of pops the first thing off of the, its own stack and it sees which one of these sealed traits was it? Which case was it? Was it a flat map? Was it a succeed? And it might do some clever optimizations there. Like if it sees that you have a flat map followed by a succeed, it'll just sort of pass that along immediately to the function instead of doing some other things. Like it can sort of look ahead. And there are probably many more opportunities for other sorts of optimizations or like pre-parsing it. But it's not even really that clever. It just um, it just sort of loops through your description and, and translates it to actually running code. And, and then, but because it's this description, it can do very powerful things. Um, I mean, yeah. that's basically you're basically describing a compiler. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. what this intermediate form? What is the? What does it look like? I mean, it's is it some kind of opcodes or? Oh no! So it's not. So that's kind of where I was like, maybe it's not. It's not quite the full compiler pattern. It's it doesn't have many transpilation passes. It's really just this. Um, so when you say like zo dot succeed, it creates a case class called, I think, succeed, <laughs> actually, um, or effect total rather, um, technically, which is just a case class that wraps, like if it's say a zo of R E A, right? It has these three type parameters. Um, when you call zo dot succeed and you pass in like an integer. It will give you back. It'll make a case class called zo.succeed, which will just basically be a, a, a function uh, from unit to that integer. It'll just wrap it in a function and put it in in a case class. So it's just going to be a function to a really, and that will extend a zo of any nothing a. And that's because with variance, the any will be able to sort of be merged with anything else and, and have, it has no requirements in the environment. That's kind of how you can think think about it. It'll run in any environment. The nothing error will basically say, well, this can't error, obviously, because you just succeeded with the number. And the result type is going to be the A. So it'll compose and with variance, it'll, it, yeah, it, it's just more flexible that way. Um, but yeah, it's just a case class, really, when you do zero succeed. And, and likewise, when you do call flat map or you combine two uh, zeros in a four comprehension, which uses flat map, these sugars into calling flat map, that will create a case class called flat map, which will have this, uh, a, two, two sort of parameters. One, the ZO on the left-hand side, that's just there, like ZO, and it has its types. And on the right-hand side, it's, a, it's going to be a function from the result of that left-hand side ZO, so an A, to another ZO of a B. And that extends a ZO of whatever, R, E, B. Um, so it's just these these case classes that just basically take what you wrote it and basically turns it into an abstract syntax tree of the, the sort of the thing that you wrote, which is just a fancy way of saying just some silly case classes and sealed traits. Like it's it's very simple. And there's um, a way actually, to look at these. Oh, to totally! If you just command clicks, so that's kind of how I started learning about it. If you're an IntelliJ, and it's such so powerful. I'm so I love IntelliJ. But can, is there any way to like dump out your AST, like like see the actual? AST. Oh, so, so most of the time, it's actually, uh, you're not going to be able to introspect too far because of flat map. The, the second parameter of the flat map being right. a function and functions right. are sort of opaque. You yep. can't inspect them. Right. So uh, there, if, if, if now there are, there are different ways of representing that kind of code that might be fully introspectable, but basically the trade-offs would be a complete loss of sort of ergonomic. No one would ever want to write that code. Like the people have examples online. There's some very cool conceptual codes of, of like people writing in the arrow style. Like you don't want to write an entire program in the arrow style with the current tools of programming. Maybe in some future language, we could do further optimizations, but it wouldn't be too interesting. You could always just print line out your Zeo effect and it'll show you what sort of case class it is. But most of the time, it's just going to be a, a top level flat map node and you're not going to be able to see past the first. It's just going to say Lambda is the continuation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so yeah, no, it's it's kind of I, I did do a talk called Troll Driven Development uh, <laughs> at Scala Love, where I uh, first talk about stuff called free effects or free monads and stuff and free structures, and then after that little preamble, I I write basically Zio from scratch in twenty minutes, at least a stupid version of it, but up to concurrency, and you can sort of like uh, parallelize things. Um, and and so it just is really just building a, a sealed trait in a case classes and, and, a, and a run method um, on that that trait, which is uh, it's pretty simple actually. Yeah. I actually found myself on a car ride without an internet connection at one point, and I had not downloaded Zio as a dependency in my project. So inspired by that talk, I took a stab at my own version, uh, obviously less complete. 
but you made it seem possible. You know, you can get those handful of types that will you know, sufficiently represent the program. I wonder if yeah. that would be a way to try and introduce it at some point in the book, say, here's a, here's a tiny toy version of Zio so that you can see. And it's a possibility we're thinking about. I, yeah, I, I definitely I think it can help because it's not many lines. I think the whole file is like 80 lines of code. And that was with examples too, I think. Um, especially if you just have some very basic version. Um, because most of the complexity, I think in most software, like the core is quite simple. And you can make toy versions of things. I love doing that. It's a very great educational exercise. Make toy versions of things. And it's quite easy, even if the, the actual software seems like to be a, I know, a 30,000 line code base, because most much of that code is like edge cases, extra features, mm -hmm. performance, debuggability, boring real world things you need to deal with, but you don't need to care about in a toy version that actually shows the idea. Um, so I think that's very, very much the case with functional effects. It's a very simple concept at, at, at its core. Nice. Though hmm. when you have like interruption and error handling. <laughs> scopes and all that stuff it the, gets, uh, you know the work stealing cues and <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's where the complexity is um so mm -hmm. when and I'm, I'm not sure if you know this but when john started doing this project what problem was he trying to solve or problems i guess but usually there's like one pain point I don't know. We need to just have John on sometime. But. Yeah, you guys should <laughs> at some definitely point. have John. We're smart enough to ask him the right That's questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, I definitely recommend that. I, I can't say for sure, but I think I do remember because uh, that was before my time. Uh, I think it started out as as the Scala Z effect type, yeah. and I think it was sort of an idea. I think it's sort of first implementation was the idea of adding the the error channel. Maybe that was like its differentiation. It was the I/O was like the first. Was, that was the first like big advertised yeah. marketable feature of it, I think. So I think that was kind of its point of, of differentiation. Yeah. But I mean, it definitely sets itself apart from other other libraries. I think I, I've seen, maybe that's because I'm just in the, the Zio ecosystem for the most part. And I see the, the patterns there, which obviously sort of steal in a good way from Zio of, of sort of embracing variants. That's a big sort of theme. Um, using concretion, so not not maximizing abstraction and making everything type classes, kind of avoiding type classes in general and dealing with um, uh, concrete data that describes its purpose <laughs> instead of instead of a type class, um, which is just easier to, you know, find methods on. It's like coming from Haskell, there is definitely FP people have this inclination and this, this drive, this pathological drive to abstract everything. And I was there too. Like I want to point point free style like don't refer to arguments just compose functions you feel like a wizard you're just like doing this crazy tetris thing and it's unreadable to anyone else you can't read it five seconds after you wrote it <laughs> but it compiles and it works and it feels important there's like some air of yes this is necessary uh and, and but but it's you know there's this thing called the state monad in haskell which is like a, a fancy way of uh passing along state and representing state and and, and imperative systems by just doing function composition and and chaining together sort of hiddenly uh secretly a bunch of tuples uh in the background and and it's very it's very cool and it feels important and i and i like liked that model but i realize that that's not really any better than just using a var <laughs> for the most part and then also uh, in, in a functional <laughs> in a functional effect system you would just have like a ref a mutable ref that you could pass around um, to maybe make it a little better than just imperative programming. But you're really modeling imperative programming. But for some reason, these sort of functional constructs seem holy. Uh, I was there. I don't understand it. Um, but uh, yeah, and a lot, and a lot, it's, it's, it's tough to do FP and resist that urge. And I think Zio is kind of the first thing that sort of fused together both worlds for me, where it like took the learnings of, of category theory and compositionality where it counts, but also of concretion and of simplicity, uh, and and it's nice because Zio sort of yes, it's a concretion. It's it's not purely abstract, um, but it really, really, really precisely models like the problem domain of like application development, <laughs> where which is what we all do most of the time, ninety nine percent of the day. So it's kind of like there's this dual of the primitive obsession thing from OO, except for FP people where they like want abstraction obsession 
and they just refuse to con- concretize. And, and instead of just building something that's spe- specific to the domain that they're actually working in 99% of the time, they're going to piece it together from all these. They're going to make a giant monad transformer stack. And it's going to be incomprehensible to read and write and deal with. And they could have just hard coded it in some way. And I think that's <laughs> kind of the, 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 there's the, yeah, the power of concretion. It needs to be more exploited. Yeah. There's a, balance, why I started a balance there between abstraction and concretion. And yeah. And you could go too far in either direction mm-hmm. for various reasons, but they, but that balance is probably what is ultimately helping you solve problems most efficiently or something. <laughs> yeah. No, there's a, there's a duality. There's a, a dialectic between, between this and, 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 and many, many of those sort of, in, you know, in software development countervailing forces that you have to, you know, it's balance true. and you're going to constantly be on the wrong side. Like when do you refactor it? You have to get, let things get, a little complicated to know what the pattern is, but you don't want to keep letting it grow and then you're screwed. So it's, it's yeah. always. Yeah. You see that way. too with like the monolith versus microservices. And it's like, like you don't really know how your microservices should be structured until you've like built the monolith. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and just back and forth. The in-between thing the doesn't get a word. It doesn't get a term. It doesn't right. get a conference. It doesn't uh, get an identity. And then, you know, people were sort of tribal and we sort of hem to one side or the other, you know, trench, trench warfare is what we do. It's hard to be in and, the tension between those two sides. Yeah. But I think there's also, if you can, if you can, if you can weather the, the, the buffeting in there, there's a lot of potential. Yeah. So for uh, solving specific problems, which you're obviously interested in, you've got this Zio app project, which mm. I think is a, a great way to you know get someone started in the path of you know how do you apply this to a real world application. You know, so what are your your goals with that project? Yeah, what is Zio app? Yeah, so very very silly sort of. Um, as I mentioned, I sort of really first started with with Ruby on Rails, which I could never write again. In, in unfortunately, I've, yeah. I've <laughs> You've been I could too. not survive the stress of not having types. Uh, nonetheless, it was really pleasurable to write when I first learned. It was you know the, the, it sort of got fame from DHH's like fifteen minute blog. A blog, write a blog in fifteen minutes from scratch. You know, get all the models. He runs one CLI command, and he gets a form that he can post and it, and, uh, you know, he gets the index page and it has validation. It has everything. It automatically migrates stuff. Really cool user experience. Um, uh, it has this sort of querying thing called active record, which is very high level, very nice. It's all it's super easy and people like it. It's, it's all about practicality. That's kind of the beauty of dynamic programming languages. They don't have laws. They don't have <laughs> composability. So the only thing that they have is convenience. And so if you're not convenient, you die and you're replaced with something that's more convenient than you. So it's a nice sort of Darwinian evolution of, of things that are convenient. And it, that has its limits and it's hard to maintain large applications, but the beginning experience is very nice. And it, Rails is incredibly popular, vastly more popular than Scala, maybe than Scala ever will be. Hopefully not. Um, so I wanted to sort of see, so I started this experiment of just like, what, what would that look like? in the world of Scala? What would that look like in the world of Zio? Not copying everything, not doing the dynamic things, not doing like name, like it's important to name what your files are, right? In Rails, you need everything named in the right folder structure. Um, so, but that also your, has benefits. So it's your attempt to bring that convenience, bring some of that convenience to the world of Zio. Yeah, I- exactly. And it's, so currently it's it's just kind of a few sort of semi-related projects, one of which is... Uh, a little live reloading thing because I'm I like building these full stack applications Me using Scala JS. Love the live on, on reload. The front. Exactly. So so this this is currently in its current state. It starts a little. Uh, it pipes two SBT processes into the web browser. I made a, a GUI for it, and so you'll see sort of your front end and back end live reloading compilation uh, output. You know, with colorizing and all that, and. Uh, and also it loads a dev server using Vite, some whatever JavaScript to serve, serve that. So it'll open that up in a separate tab. And then you'll have these two tabs, one with all your compilation output, one with your app. So you make changes, you see it, everything reloads the back end, the server, et cetera. So that's, that's one half. Um, because there's this like rail serve command that does that, except only for the back end. Um, so it's just like really simple. Oh, it also has a new command. So like create React app. Instead of Gitter 8, which good in concept, most Gitter 8s I found are out of date and it's, 
basically useless. Um, so to make my own, I've just made, you know, it clones a, t- a template that's opinionated and, and sort of kept up to date. Uh, just like the Rails new command, just like get started, remove the activation cost. Here's an app. Here's, it, you can see stuff on your screen in five seconds. Um, and then the other part of this is 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 sort of figuring out how to solve some of these other problems. So um, have you heard of Li Haoyi's auto wire? I don't know if I've uh, seen auto wire. Seen I auto have. Wire? It, I briefly used it in a Scala.js app years ago. The concept is very cool. I was never actually able to get it to work myself because it is a little less opinionated. Um, but the idea is you write a trait, an interface, and you can call that interface from the front end, and it basically makes RPC calls to an interface on the back end, an implementation on the back end. And you have to you know, configure it with a sort of a way to serialize and, and a server and a client as well. Um, and I never was able to get that to work. So it's I basically kind of made GRPC-ish. a version of that. ish Exactly. It's gRPC-ish. Um, yeah, with so Scala it's, traits it's, instead of instead of protobuster. exactly just more native, less less you know less overhead, less boilerplate, and so I wanted to make a very opinionated version of that. That on the back end, you call you give you make some traits in some shared directory. It has some methods on it. Um, it should be a Zio service, so they'll all return Zio effects. Um, and then on the back end, you say like derive routes for you just parameterize it by that trait, um, and then it'll you know you can plug that into your server. Um, you do like app.start, plug in those routes. It uses ZOHTTP, which is a, a library. So it just generates the routes that you need for that trait. On the front end, you do derive client. It gives you a back a client. Then you can call those methods and it will make the RPC calls and it, and it maintains the ZO semantics. So if there's an error on the back end, it'll propagate that. You can use ZO streams. It'll do that over HTTP streams. Um, it's totally for closed source systems. Uh, and there's no documentation for that yet, but I have some examples and, and showed that off in one of those symposium videos. So it's it's it's... You know, it's really just the idea of 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 Li Hao Yi's thing, except hard coded to Zio, and uh, you know, uh, maintaining Zio semantics. And I think, like once again, the power of the power of concretion of opinionation is now now people don't have to fuss with and fail like I did to set it up correctly. It's just going to work because uh, it's opinionated. It doesn't work with everything, but it works with something that I think is a pretty good general solution. And uh, so that, that 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 comes with the, the whatever the zo app dot new command, and then you can kind of use that potentially. And it's just going to explore more of those types of conveniences, um, and when I can use macros, and when you can use combinator libraries, and etc. Huh. Sort of speed cool. up. We also were curious about how uh, Zyverge works. Like, do they have a an <laughs> office any place, or is it all completely distributed and when you've been there, three months, six months? I think three months. It feels like I started in probably feels like ma- a year, but March <laughs> at the end of March. I think it feels like a very long time. Yeah. But uh, it, uh, so you've done a lot. In yeah, three months. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I was definitely doing some open source stuff before with them. Um, but yeah, I joined in March. Um, we are remote, fully remote. Yeah, it's it's a very global team. So there are people in in Europe. I think we're about 20 people now or, or so. Um, and, and a few in the US, um, myself and Adam are both on the West Coast. So we tend to work together a lot. We're currently both um, working for Capital One at the moment, contracted out to Capital One, which nice. is really fun. That's cool. And what is the the breakdown of you know how you're spending your time, whether it's like core Zio projects, client closed source projects or just general open source, you know, not related to Zyverge directly? Sure. Uh, well, I guess, you know, client projects during the day. And then I, I do, I'm a bit addicted. I tend to work a lot. So after like Adam and I did do some Twitch streaming last night for a couple of hours. Uh, so we tend to, you know, work, um, work after hours uh, sometimes, but I mean, it's not really work to me. I enjoy it. Zio is your lot. job and your hobby. Yeah. Jobby. 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 <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I got some other, other hobbies too, but that's definitely uh, a, a big one. Um, and, 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 and yeah, I mean, for me, it's mostly, I, I pair a lot with Adam on, on open source things. We sort of are, are working on, on a bunch of different Zio sub projects and tools and fixing up tests and adding sort of different features and, and doing the trainings as well, uh, which is really fun. I love teaching that was my first job actually i worked at the boot camp that i i went to and oh, nice. so i always loved 
so rambling about stuff. The business model is that you have clients, so like consulting clients, mm -hmm. and then also training. Uh, yes, I think John mostly does the, the those trainings for now. I mean, ours are just free on YouTube, which is kind of, you know, I mean, coincidentally marketing and stuff like that. But mostly I, I wanted to do it. I, they didn't ask me to start that. I was just like, I want to, would you guys be down with this? And they're like, yeah, of course, <laughs> let's let's promote it and, and do it. Nice. Um, so, yeah, it's just been very sort of, yeah, oh, refreshingly low overhead, just kind of doing what needs to get done based on what we're interested in. And, you know, and everyone's. I mean, Adam's just, oh, you guys should definitely talk to Adam one day. He's the, he's the sweetest guy yeah. uh, and super smart and uh, has a really interesting sort of story. I thought he was definitely coding for like 80 years or something, but he's he's pretty new to the industry as well. Wow. Uh, I think Zyverges is, is actually his like first tech job, which is That's wild. ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, it's he really seems ridiculous. like he should be very gray, you know, he's, yeah, he's right. much wisdom and... <laughs> So no, it's it's been an honor and a, and a, and you know just to for so long I just wanted to you know work with a bunch of people who were nice and passionate and cared about the same stuff I did and uh, you know besides the uh, the erstwhile person like Bill um, you know not everyone's as insane as me at my jobs uh, in the past and so it's great to work with people who are as crazy and <laughs> as me and like are down to just oh yeah I it's like not. I don't have to be guilty about saying, hey, do you want to do this thing? Is this embarrassing if you want to like stay up late and hack on this thing? And they're like, no, that sounds awesome and fun. And let's talk about this stuff and 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 uh, teach each other. It's fun to learn and it's a crazy cool thing to build stuff. I like programming. It's very magical. It is. You mentioned uh, Zio HTTP and mm -hmm. that's, that's the one that's based on Netty, right? Because there's Uzi exactly. that's its own like... Uh, implementation of HTTP. And then there's um, some uh, Zio TLS, whatever one. And there then, are many. There, yeah, there's there many, are many, many options, but you're using the, the Netty based one, right? Yeah, yeah. No, they're definitely like, uh, I, I, yeah, it can be definitely, I think, a little confusing to some, someone who's just complaining the other day, like, which library should I use? And like, I don't, well, I, I use the Zio HTTP one. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, I, the, the the maintainer is really nice. They're using it at a company that serves a lot of things. They have very like concrete requirements that are driving it out, and they're I like the design of it. Uh, so uh, the so yeah, performance but that's is, is pretty astonishing. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, it basically uses Netty's performance, which yeah. is really good performance with very little overhead. Um, it's kind of an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting design. It's kind of a very simple implementation of of basically doing some clever things and and exposing a really nice API over. Netty, which is totally yeah. a viable way to do things instead of like rebuilding the world from scratch every time. Yeah, and the routing um, DSL seemed seemed nice too. Yeah, it's that's basically very similar to HTTP for us. I'm yeah. not really sure what yeah. the other predecessors are, but that's basically if you're familiar with that, it's uh, yeah, it's nice. You use a, like a, a a partial function in case on some like yeah. little DSL for you know users slash ID. Yeah. And it'll it'll pattern match that out for you. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with the project, but do you know how it would compare to like Tapir? Oh, so Tapir is a little different. That's one of these sort of combinator libraries. This this like DSL for describing routes and endpoints, and then you can interpret that into different servers. Um, so I think someone's working on a Tapir Zio HTTP integration. So it would kind of be like my method called derive routes, which gives you a ZHTTP router which then is composable so you can like take what i derive from that little zeo app thing and combine that with just a manually written uh route or a potentially a to peer generated route so one might imagine like you'd say okay we want to with to peer you say something like it's a get request at this address and it accepts this kind of payload and it uh you can add some documentation help screens and you can generate from that dsl it's kind of very much like zeo it's a it's a case class hierarchy it's a it's a it's a data type representing an endpoint in some abstract notion of endpoint and then you can reinterpret that into uh an actual route that you can run in an http app or documentation uh or open api things or like a client library because it has enough information in in the core description that it can uh yeah uh distribute these different implementations be interpreted differently and then there's some work being done on zia schema which is i think will be related in some way to Zio HTTP and Zio Web and some of that, but I haven't looked mm -hmm. too far into what the Zio Schema stuff is doing. 
Well. Yeah, wow, we do have a lot of libraries, don't we? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Zio Schema is is primarily being motivated now for another project called Zio Flow, which is this uh, distributed sort of application uh, uh, um, for modeling and executing distributed workflows that are sort of resilient and fault tolerant. I think it has some predecessors. That's not really my area of expertise. I've uh, It's kind of being maintained by um, Ash currently uh, for good cover. Um, so that's def- that's a kind of a client sponsored project. And, yeah. So uh, I guess in, schema- in the case of, of Zyverge, some of the projects that are being worked on are, customer a customer needs it and so you all then will be able to do some of that stuff in open source is that how that works yeah i think i mean that's kind of uh, i think the ideal scenario or one of the ideal scenarios where you know you have a client that wants something that could technically if you squint can be useful to many people and then they'll sponsor it we can build it in public get feedback it'll be you know all the benefits of open source and uh no that's that's super cool when that works out Yes. We've got a couple of those. So one of the things that has been bugging me about Zio is that Ooh, yes. it's described as a library. And the more that I learn about it, the more it seems like at least kind of a framework or maybe a lifestyle choice. You know, <laughs> it, it's not, you know, I think of a library as like, here's a thing that does something. I call it, I, I, you know, I bring it in, I ask it to do some mm-hmm. things, and then I've got the rest of my program. But Zio seems like it goes and changes your whole it's a state of mind. Yeah, it, it changes the whole way that you're programming. So calling it a library just doesn't feel right to me. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those uh, semantic uh, things. I'm not sure where I fall on it. Uh, it's it's it is what it is. It's it's um, you know, there's a spectrum of opinionation, and it's certainly more opinionated than certain other libraries. Um, and I think with functional effects, you know, they force you in order to be useful to sort of, everything must be subsumed into a functional effect. So everything it touches, uh, it can, you know, it can interoperate, but you have to call the unsafe run method, uh, which I've definitely done a lot in the past when integrating Zio into larger projects. But yeah, it does kind of spread. I think it's a, it's a, it's a good virus. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pandemic of, of, of normalization and of clear thinking. Um, like I, uh, well, I'm just uh, yeah. thinking in terms of how to explain it to people, you know, because it, mm-hmm. if someone says, oh, you know, if they're used to the idea of a library, mm-hmm. they're not used to the library coming in and saying, oh, well, now all of your code is you're going to want to write it. Differently. <laughs> that does, that's not what most people are used to when they think of a library. So I'm thinking, well, maybe there's a better name for this. Yeah. Maybe it's like a difference between like a, a house guest and like someone you've like that. Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking of those old, terrible like reality shows where you invite someone into your house to like teach your kids to eat right or something, or they take over. Uh, I don't it know what that a is. Like a roommate rather character. than a house, than a, a temporary house guest. Yes, it's yes, it's uh, it's definitely yeah. It's going to be a little louder and more opinionated than just a, a little like a house guest pad library for uh, <laughs> interior decorating. <laughs> I, I would accept framework. I think that's a that's that's an acceptable. Uh, I can't argue with you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay. That might help people understand and prepare mm-hmm. sort of mentally for what it is. We'll just start calling it a framework and see how that goes. I'm Ooh. reporting you, John. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> The uh, brand police coming after us. Yeah. <laughs> if it's a library, I think it's like a tax thing. If it's a library, yeah, it's one tier. And if it's a framework, it's another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, anything else? Um, well, I just like, I'm hoping that we can reach out to you and ask questions when we get stuck on yeah, well, ideas. Yeah, do a podcast every time you have a question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> The uh, Discord, nope, nope. the Discord, you all are are great at, at being so responsive on the Discord channel. So, oh, it's, okay. it's well, yeah, it's just like that's Adam's, like you know, somehow omnipresence. Uh, it's amazing. It's, <laughs> I'll be like pairing with him, and then I'll see that he's also like while contributing and talking with me has like answered ten questions. Like, yeah, I'm, like uh, your clones. Is he, seriously, that's the only explanation is that he has clones. Mm. The Adams Fraser. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, Bill, your brother. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, what. Yeah, uh, but yeah, please ask me any time, and if you're obviously open invite onto our little, uh, you know, it could be fun. We have that little YouTube thing. It's, it's basically no laws except that we do a Zoom chat and talk about things. But if you want to like join us one day and live code on some stuff and 
that'd be we, fun. You know, if you have some, if you want to get our opinions on something, best practiceify some <laughs> demos or whatever. Um, happy yeah. that would be fun too. Ooh, nice, cool. Well, thanks so much, Kit. We really appreciate your time and all that you do to make Zio and everything better. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's been a it's been a it's been a great pleasure. Yeah, thanks. It's good to have nice people on the internet, and and you. It's uh, good to meet nice people in the flesh or a flesh like <laughs> near really flesh. Fun. Yes, and we'll get you to the Summer Tech Forum Unconference so you can join yes, us here in on. person. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everyone.